devices. The megatrend of intellectual properties plays an increasing role in silicon SOC solutions, which brings computing core and ASIC much closer to various applications in our lives. What brand new user experiences in wearable devices, perceptual computing, voice recognition, deformable displays, all these computing devices are connected via wired or wireless communication network with I.O. interfaces for information collection, processing, and presentation. Semiconductor technologies remain at the kernel to drive the future innovation with ubiquitous and instantaneous computing at both local devices and cloud servers. Please join us now as we listen to our distinguished speakers from industry leading companies to learn the future impacts and opportunities in the era of Internet of Everything. In our first presentation titled Enabling the Surround Computing Age, um, since the advent of the PC, computer industry has been sourced for increased productivity, gross domestic product, and personal connections. We are on the cusp of a new wave of efficiency and fresh applications to improve business operations and enrich personal experiences, the surround computing era. This will be the era of ubiquitous computing used in a multitude of devices, totally integrated in the environment and seamlessly woven into our everyday life and even into our clothes. Surround computing imagines a world without keyboards or mice where natural user interfaces based on voice and facial recognition redefine the computing experience and where the cloud and clients collaborate to synthesize exabytes of data. AMD's CTO Mark Papermaster will discuss surround computing trends and enablers as well as the key role that semiconductors play in the next era of computing. So Mark Papermaster is Senior Vice President and CTO at AMD's Engineering R&D and Product Development. Um, and he's responsible, for, uh, uh, okay, and he has 30 years of engineering experience with significant leadership roles managing the development of a wide range of products spanning from low power handhelds to high performance blade servers. Previous to AMD, he was the Vice President of Silicon Engineering Group at Cisco, where he led an organization responsible for silicon strategy, architecture, and development for the company's switching and routing businesses. He also served as Vice President of Devices Hardware Engineering at Apple, where he was responsible for the iPod and iPhone hardware development, and held several senior leadership roles at IBM, including serving on their technical leadership team and overseeing development of the company's key microprocessor and blade server technologies. He's a member of the University of Texas Cockrell School of Engineering Advisory Board and Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation IT Advisory Committee. Mr. Papermaster holds a BS in Electrical Engineering from the University of Texas at Austin, as well as an MSEE at the University of Vermont. So please give me a warm welcome to Mark Papermaster. starting off the conference hit the nail on the head. We really are at a point of change in the industry. And, you know, I think back, I've been doing this a number of years, and it's sort of like, here we go again, it's, you know, we're always at this period of change. And it's true, uh, we, you know, if you're in technology, which uh, I'm assuming all of you are, uh, you know that it is nothing but change. In fact, if you're not changing, you're left behind very, very quickly. So it's not just that we're in this period of change, it's, it's really that it's an inflection point. It's an inflection point uh, in terms of 
really how we're using computing. So let's think about the change in the last, oh, let's say 10, 15 years. So we've seen it as we've had the mobile revolution, right? So everything, every year is coming down in size. Uh, we've come to take for granted the fact that we're uh, you know, having these mobile devices that are connected. And we've come to take for granted the fact that as we interface with that computing, you know, gone are the days of point and click and, you know, it really is very much a touch and a visual experience that we have with computing. So that's, that's, that's done. And, and the change there has been rapid every year. More capability, more battery life every year. Got it. So that change is going on and it's, and it's, you know, it's, you know, something, as I say, that we've come to just take for granted. But I think what we're talking about now, Liang hinted at it, is fundamentally changing how we interface with computing. Because the, the fact that now the cost of connectivity has gone down. And so it's not just that you know, communications device in your pocket. It's not just that smartphone uh, that, that you have that's, that's connected. It's everything, right? I mean, you, you know, I look at my own home. I mean, you know, it's, I, I control the temperature. I control all my music. I can, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know I can look at the, the, the refrigerators that I have. Really, every device has got sensors or connectivity in it. So you have this pervasive connectivity that, that you have, you know, really prevalent. Secondly, uh, when you look at really, uh, you know, the, the uh, kind of interface that we're doing, you've seen the hint of that change where you know, it's kind of rudimentary today, but it's the cusp of radical change of motion detection, voice recognition, you know, how we're interfacing with the computer is fundamentally starting to change. And the services that are available in the cloud to provide us information and you know, process those zettabytes of data which are being created in the internet today are being processed in the cloud and giving you back meaningful information. That capability has become really phenomenal with big data, how it can analyze and send back to you very relevant information. When you add those three together, it's fundamental. And uh, you know, really, uh, uh, Mark Weiser uh, at uh, Park Research Labs, or at Park just down the road in, uh, in Mountain View, uh, said it years ago. He said that you know, technology really becomes pervasive when you fail to notice it anymore. It becomes, you know, just woven in the fabric of our lives. That's the best implementation of technology is when you don't even notice it. You're using it, it just becomes ubiquitous in its implementation. And that's what we're seeing now. Uh, and these three trends are really accelerating that advent. So, you know, what are these things? It is, it is that fluid interface. So, you know, you're, it's still choppy today. Uh, you know, you'll do uh, Siri on your iPhone, you'll do Google Voice, uh, you know, you've got the, uh, on, uh, on Microsoft Connect, on, on uh, you know, plenty of the PCs and tablets, you're starting to see that, uh, that gesture recognition, but again, it's just at the cost. It's still, you know, it's, it's that nascent capability, but when it becomes fluid, and when you have that seamless interface, when that voice recognition becomes near perfect, and identifying what you're saying, and, and beyond recognizing that, and really interpreting, and combining that information with your voice and gesture you're providing with the location you're at, with the data that's being provided, the sensors that are all around you. You'd be shopping at a store, it's gonna know what your shopping list is, what you're looking for, and it's gonna provide that information back to you in a very seamless and meaningful way. That's what we call at AMD, surround computing era because it is surround us. It has just woven in the fabric of our lives and it's gonna change, absolutely change the way that we interface with computing and consume data and provide data going forward. So you look at some of these applications and you'll, you'll recognize it, right? You know, I, I like one, you know, I, I talked about some of the, you know, some of the things that, uh, as I say, voice or, uh, or up, excuse me. Let's, uh, now I realize that this, if you press and, uh, and hold, this is just going to run on its own here, so let me be careful not to do that. 
It's that's part of surround computing too. It, uh, <laughs> so look, you know, I love movies, and you know when I look at this series called Iron Man, I've seen Iron Man one, two, three. What I love, if you haven't seen the movie, and if you love technology, you've got to see one of the series. But the thing I love the most is the way that Robert Downey Jr., the actor, is interfacing with technology throughout the movie. He's a designer, he's an architect of inventive things, and it's all 3D. He's manipulating the shapes, he's moving around, he's, in, he's you know, architecting you know, his next robot, his next thing. When he puts his robot suit on, it's augmented reality as he's moving and he's you know, flying to, you know, to, to save mankind, then you look at all the information that's being sent down to him, it's, it's real time, it's fluid, it's all relevant as to what he needs, and you say, wow, that's great, that's great science fiction. But it's not, it's not 30 years away, it's not 50 years away, it's coming at us very quickly. And just like you know, when I grew up, there was this idea of, you know, in the cartoons of the, of this, uh, you know, smart device, the smart watch that would have, you know, communications capability to you, and you know, it'd be, a, you know, it'd be a, a, a real link, uh, you know, to to technology. And and now that's, of course, we have that. I mean, that's that's what the new products all are coming out with today. Uh, that's what the stuff of Mar Iron Man will be in literally five to ten years, and its advent is being accelerated, and it's being accelerated uh, through you know, uh, advances that are in the client, that are in the server technology uh, that's behind this, and that are in the cloud technology. Because it turns out that those workloads, like I uh, gave you examples of, uh, have, a, have some uh, very common traits. Uh, you know, when you look at, uh, it, at what's been going on, you know, we get advances of computing every year. So it gets smaller, uh, you get, you know, used to be able to just rely on uh, technology semiconductor node advanced to be able to get that game. But that went away, uh, you know, we still get some games, but it's not at the rate at all it used to be. It's not fueling Moore's, Moore's law by itself. So we started adding more CPU cores, and that was great. And that helped fuel uh, the advancement of technology. But it, it goes beyond that now. When you look at uh, many of these workloads that I just showed you, they're really parallel operations that are, that are repetitive, it's search algorithms. Uh, it's, it's parallel processing, and when you accelerate that, uh, you can speed and uh, the advent of those capabilities, but you've got to attack it at the client, at the server, at the cloud. So let's start with uh, you know just talking about clients. I mean, it, it really is that point of interface that you have to technology. It's that device that, that you're taking with you everywhere. Uh, if, it's, uh, if you're doing content creation, you probably still want a, you know, a keyboard, uh, but you're 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 going to have a very touch intensive. You you want that you want that voice recognition, that uh, the video conferencing capability. Uh, you want to have you know right on your desktop. It's on that mobile device with you everywhere you go, and you need real time. The only way this works, if you know, if you if you had a an area that had poor connectivity, uh, you can't wait. You need that processing local. You want you you need the video processing to be very, very rapid, you need it to be seamless. So the client you know, has to be accelerated to give you that seamless interface. When you look at what's going on in, in the servers, uh, they're really limited today on a lot of capability, uh, not just by the horsepower, but frankly even the, the power consumption per square foot of the data center uh, can be daunting uh, to be able to give you the horsepower to accelerate these kind of workloads. And so when you uh, when you look at uh, what's, got to, what's got to change on, on uh, server technology is we need more and more dense server computing. Get the capability uh, into a very, very small footprint and be able to provide that, uh, and again, very, very high rate of computation, uh, very real time, uh, but at a very, very efficient uh, performance per watt. And so that's the you know, key change that we see going on at, at server. And again, uh, we're going to attack it because we see these workloads that need to be accelerated being highly parallelizable. So you can tell I've got a, a little uh, theme going here that's probably leading up to, uh, to some technology that we might have behind that. 
Uh, let me let me talk about the cloud. The cloud is that backbone. So you've mm -hmm. got your server farms, but the cloud means much more than the engine itself. It is the ability to support all of those cloud services. You're not going to have that air of surround computing. You're not going to have all that data that you're going to uh, trust to come down to you, that you're going to even get uh, access to your personal data, your work data. You're not going to do that unless you first have trust. You've got to have security. And so any of us as technology providers, as well as fueling this exam, this, uh, this acceleration of these uh, computing trends, you have to provide a, a very rich uh, security uh, solution, which, which we do at a and actually in partnership with uh, ARM, with the Trust Zone solution, right? And you've, got, you've really got to have, uh, then at the cloud, the ability to take those zettabytes of data and be able to run the algorithms uh, that can create matches, right? They can, they can give you that artificial intelligence uh, that can do the pattern recognition, the, uh, the face recognition. So it's about having a secure uh, set of services and uh, to, to allow you to trust these, these applications that will change how you can leverage computing and its ability to have the engines underneath, both in the server farms and really the apps that sit on top have to accelerate uh, in parallelized workflows, uh, the ability to give you this transformational uh, interface with computing. So, uh, what are we doing about that? Uh, we've decided at AMD uh, to leverage in a big way uh, the fact that the computing is scalar, it is parallel, it's got to come together, it's heterogeneous computing. CPUs, GPUs working seamlessly together in heterogeneous computing is how we're going to accelerate this. And in fact, we've, uh, we've launched a foundation, a heterogeneous system architecture foundation, with the industry to allow that capability to be accelerated. Because it only works if there's a strong application base. Uh, you saw that again with the advent of mobile computing. Great technology, but until all the apps were out there for you know, whatever your device, it'd be Android, it'd be Apple, it'd be Microsoft, until the apps are out there, you didn't see the prevalent usage. It didn't change your lives. It didn't change how you were getting that information for work or play that you needed. So you've got to uh, leverage the technology by making it easy uh, to create applications. And so that's exactly what we're doing at AMV in partnership with the industry. So what HSA will make it easy to program CPUs and GPUs working in tandem. You know, it wasn't uh, that long ago, I guess it was, I'll date myself, uh, when you know the CPU didn't have math coprocessors. There was an 8086 and an 8087. And you thought, oh, if I want to do floating point operations, it's hard. I've got a separate programming model and it's just harder to do. And that, that's all, that's like a forgotten time now because of course uh, that's all within the CPU and you can you can write uh, high level languages like, like uh, C++ and and you can take advantage of all that in CPU. That is what this initiative will do to take advantage of parallelism, take advantage of those, uh, the uh, general purpose graphic processing units, and to be able to leverage parallelism. It'll be as easy as writing uh, any program that you have today. And so that's what we're doing with HSA. And we're gonna do it in a way that's very open. Right? So we're gonna, we published, uh, the, the specs have been out there, uh, they're ratified, uh, so there's a, a common application programming interface that's out there. Uh, we're, we've established uh, the, this foundation uh, that is getting the technology enablement uh, we have in our devices, uh, but our, our partners, uh, several of them are, are here today. But if you look, if you look at across the industry, uh, it's AMD with ARM, with TI, with Qualcomm, with Samsung, uh, with uh, you know a, a number of other uh, partners which are joining with us to let this be a pervasive uh, API across many many engines uh, and many many devices. That's what's going to spur this easy mode of programming, and that's what spurs the applications, uh, which are going to speed the changes that I described to you uh, to enable surround computing. Uh, you know it's pretty it's pretty uh, uh, daunting when you look at. Uh, the investments that you have to make because 
and, and, and this is a semiconductor and semiconductor uh, industry form, so you all know every square millimeter of silicon that you invest is precious. I mean, that, that is your return on investment. And you look at what we've done at AMD, you can see that we've got 40% of our silicon area dedicated to this graphics processing where we have leadership capability to provide not only that visualization, but that parallel compute capability, which now is going to be far easier to program as we go forward and leverage not only the uh, open uh, approaches that are out there today like OpenCL, but the high-level programming languages uh, through this uh, open API. So it's, uh, it's really, I, I use the word unleash, and, and that's what I see. I see that this is gonna, gonna take, uh, you know, what today is, is the, you know, supercomputers, all the big supercomputers, all leverage CPUs and GPUs and have hordes of, you know, PhDs uh, writing those programs, right? As we develop these high-level language interfaces, these APIs, uh, you're gonna see this capability unleashed uh, to all the application developers. Uh, and we're already starting to see it. You'll, you'll, you'll see it at uh, CES this year. Uh, we've got a product we're rolling out that's fully enabled uh, for heterogeneous system architecture. Uh, it's our, our latest advanced, our, our latest uh, accelerated processor unit, APU, uh, with our graphics core next, our latest uh, in CPU cores, and it's fully uh, capability, capable of heterogeneous system architecture. So uh, that's one you know, key, key investment uh, that we have that we think will spur this era of surround computing. And the other is really choice, uh, choice of instruction set architecture. Uh, so we announced this uh, publicly, uh, uh, well, I guess uh, about a year ago, uh, that we are adding ARM into our portfolio. So we'll be an x86 and ARM, very, very synergistic. Uh, when you look at this whole play around heterogeneous computing, both instruction set architectures uh, will play equally well. Both ecosystems will play equally well uh, to be able to advance computing and, uh, and push forward leveraging the parallel workloads working in tandem with, with uh, operations that work on the CPU. And so, you know, we are going to leverage our deep experience in CPU design. We've been uh, just first to actually to bring 64-bit computing uh, to commodity processors. And so when you look at ARM, is has uh, is now got their first shipping, uh, you know, 64-bit uh, devices in, in the smartphone, and you see a very uh, rapid advent We'll be leveraging our experience in 64-bit computing as we add that to our portfolio alongside our x86 offerings. And so, what I, you know, what I'd uh, like to wrap up is, uh, you know, just ask you to step back and think about this change right now. We're in a constant period of change, but now I'll submit to you that you're going to see an acceleration. You're going to really see this change of how we interface with computers starting to become incredibly fluid to the point where five to 10 years from now, it's gonna be ubiquitous. It's gonna be, you know, just seamless interface between each of us and our computing. It's gonna be accelerated by heterogeneous system architecture across the industry. It's gonna apply across uh, different instruction set architectures. This isn't, this isn't tied to any one uh, CPU architecture. Uh, it's going to have to be scalable, and so how we work together as an industry to hook up each of these devices, uh, you know, and provide that backbone of server farms and that backbone of cloud services is going to be a key enabler. And then lastly, everything that uh, those of us that, that work together in industry will have to drive relentlessly to bring the power down at each and at each uh, successive product introduction, and in fact leverage of both the CPU and the GPU so that we continue Moore's Law. It doesn't ever stop. Innovation keeps Moore's Law on a relentless pace. Uh, that's what we see at AMD. It's a very exciting time for us. And uh, I look forward to uh, uh, taking a few moments here and uh, answering uh, questions that you may have. We'll get into a little bit of dialogue. Thank you very much. Lights and I can uh, we can get a mic if there's any uh, any questions. There's a one over there. Okay. Do we is this the this, should we bring this mic to them or oh you have another mic very good. I'm 
Terry Mitri, chemical engineer, and I see in your biography that you are associated with the Juvenile, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. So I'm from India and based in San Jose, Silicon Valley. So India is known as the diabetes capital of it and heart disease capital. So I wanted to know how AMD can help produce more diabetes diagnostic and heart disease diagnostic. It's a, it's a great question. You know, commenting on that, that I've been involved in diabetes uh, research, it's very personal for me uh, because my, uh, my son was uh, diagnosed at a very young age uh, with type 1 diabetes. And what that means is that your pancreas uh, fails to work. So you normally have a closed loop system. Your pancreas is, is observing what is the blood glucose uh, uh, level in your body and then, and then basically releasing insulin to be able to keep it constant. Without a functioning pancreas, you, you have an open loop. Uh, and you'll, you'll die without regular injections of insulin. So what all of us can do uh, is by advance, it's exactly this trend we talked about, is we advance the technology and bring the computing to be uh, lower power uh, and, and to be more and more capable. Uh, what, what can be done, frankly, on the very near end uh, is a closed loop system. And so you're starting to see that today. Uh, companies like Medtronics and several others uh, have an artificial closed loop system where your blood glucose is being monitored and then can adjust and provide the, the, the correct amount of insulin. So one, I think I, I, I am pleased with all of the work that you're doing in uh, technology because it, it's helping that. Uh, and certainly at AMD, uh, we're committed as well uh, to lever you know, bringing uh, technology uh, to be part of that, that solution. So thank you very much. Good question. So, so I wanted to ask that uh, I'm from San Jose and San Jose is developing a foreign trade zone. The San Jose foreign trade zone is uh, approved by US Department of Commerce. And the main purpose of the foreign trade zone is to create jobs in San Jose. So I wanted to know if uh, AMD would be interested in coming down to San Jose to develop uh, diagnostic, diabetes diagnostics and heart disease diagnostics for India or China or anywhere in the globe. That's a great question. Uh, we are involved in the community, certainly. Uh, we do stick to our knitting, so we stay focused on, on what we do, which is uh, technology. So I, we, we actually don't develop uh, in devices, in medical devices and things that, that you describe. Uh, but I can certainly follow up with you offline and, and uh, see uh, through our community outreach uh, you know, what we could do uh, through our San Jose connection. We certainly have a large population here. Next question. Yeah, actually my question is, what is AMD's uh, plan to revolutionize uh, traditional processor architecture to tackle the challenge of big data and cloud computing. Right now, I mean, they are the biggest challenge in terms of to scale cloud, to make the elastic, we call it elastic cloud, to ta tackle lots of big data problems. Mm -hmm. You know, so the traditional processor architecture, processor architecture computer architecture, does not scale well, to be honest. Yes. Even with multiple, so what, right. what's your plan? So it, it, you know, when you look at how do you scale to attack big data problems, uh, what we've determined is actually that this heterogeneous system architecture approach does provide that scale. It does accelerate the big data. Uh, so when I describe to you this technology, it's not just for the client. It's for the client and for the cloud. It's for that processing. So we've announced today uh, through our partners and, and through the, uh, the, uh, the dense server that AMD produces that we're taking our APUs, these accelerated processing units with CPU and GPU, and we're bringing it into the cloud. Uh, Verizon just announced uh, that they're leveraging this, uh, this approach of dense server uh, in, in their network. And so where, where there's workloads that can leverage the parallelization, which it turns out are, are um, most search algorithms, most, most of these big data algorithms uh, can leverage parallelism, uh, that is our strategy uh, to really accelerate that cloud computing. And you don't have to look any further than supercomputers. If you look at Titan, which is, uh, uh, you know, the, the you know, world's, uh, 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 I'd say North America's uh, uh, largest supercomputer because the Tiani 2 in China is the world's largest uh, uh, supercomputer. But I'm very, fam you know, familiar with um, our participation uh, with Titan, and it's a CPU, GPU, uh, heterogeneous approach to provide that scale. 
What's different is, and, and you're saying, what is AMD doing? Those are traditional coaches. So the CPU is separate from the GPU, and it's connected by a link. It's like a straw that connects them. It's called PCI Express uh, Bus Interconnect. So you're limited as you operate in one mode versus the other as to how you can interconnect through that straw. What we're doing at AMD to accelerate uh, that computing is, uh, with our approach of our APUs, it's a shared memory. You don't move data from a CPU to the GPU. It stays resident in memory. And so you can provide tremendous acceleration and much lower power uh, by having this shared memory, whether you're operating on the CPU or the GPU side, uh, that data set can be addressed with coherent memory between the two. And it turns out that that provides a very significant acceleration of computing and lower power. Actually, you know, that's probably a good point. But the reason is, you know, because of the priority issue, I mean, any innovation in terms of at the processor level is not at the reason why Hadoop is so popular So it, you have to have modularity and scalability with each of these solutions. And so, you know, again, uh, you know, I think what you have to do is provide a very, very effective uh, core capability, right? And we're attacking that with this APU approach uh, to be able to provide more scale. They have to be connected uh, with very, very efficient uh, fabrics. And then those fabrics have to be connected uh, cluster by cluster, right, uh, you know, through uh, the backbone. So yeah, it's, it's, again, it's a very exciting time. We will not see this change I described without ingenuity at the client, at each of the servers, and that cloud backbone. So I, I think your question's uh, just dead on. Very last, one. last question. Yeah. When is the day you move, uh, I share your say, assignment. Uh, a couple years ago, we were talking about the cloud computing, and then which will address the efficiency of the server farm. And then now you, uh, as HSA put, uh, put in place in order to let the so-called much more efficient or the revolutionize the computing environment. Can you share the vision of the true cloud computing combined the, with the broadband wireless like the 4G and the 4G and beyond and the, with the multiple core of the client side? Okay, this year people already planned the eight cores uh, for the, the client side. And then to create so-called uh, highly efficient to know to achieve either uh, power consumption or the low latency or, uh, for example, it's, uh, I'm very, very excited is uh, uh, AMD CPU powers both Microsoft and the Sony. That's, uh, and the AMD's uh, CPU also powers a lot of the desktop. But the trouble for the consumer is that it never had a chance to link those two compu computing or the storage or the any power together in order to achieve the very efficient goal. So uh, I'd like to know your personal opinion to see in the next three to five years will the people put some effort to make this thing happen. Combine the cloud and the server or combine the desktop or combine any other non-homogeneous in order to provide a much better efficient way. Thank you. So how do you how do you at the end change this experience? That's what you're talking about. How, you know, there's this LTE is coming from a connectivity standpoint. It, it's out there today. It offers a much higher bandwidth, and you'll see continual improvements. So we will be connected. That's not an if. We are today, and our connectivity will simply grow. The bandwidth will grow generation over generation. The latency will drop generation over generation. So it's not a question. You know, our connectivity will change. And so innovative products of today are assuming that you'll have that connectivity. Uh, you mentioned game consoles. So if you look at the next generation uh, Microsoft uh, Xbox One, the next generation uh, PlayStation 4, uh, they are based on AMD technology. Uh, they're based on uh, AMD CPU and GPU, but they're custom chips then put together uh, to attack those markets and to provide an experience, a tailored experience. And each of those type of uh, console products is of course assuming that you have connectivity. You can, you, can, you can run standalone, you can run games on them, 
but it's when you have that connectivity that it opens the whole application set to you. So that's where you're playing games with, uh, I have a 15-year-old son, so I can tell you firsthand, you know, he's, he's, he can play games any time of the day or night with anyone across the world. He can shop anywhere on these consoles. Uh, he can message with his friends, uh, you know, and you can, you, you can video conference. And so, you know, it is enabled by that connectivity. So that's now an assumption. And you start building up how you accelerate with uh, all of the applications set on top of it. And that's how our AMD approach with uh, accelerated processing units and then making it easier to create these applications uh, with things like we do as heterogeneous system architecture and working with gaming providers to make it very easy for them to program on their platform will we'll bring at the end what makes a difference to you and all of us as consumers, the experience. It's all about a solution that makes a better experience for you. Well, again, thank you very much for having me and I uh, look forward to seeing you over the course of the, country, the uh, course of the conference. Thanks again. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Um, we have a small gift as our tradition to purchase the keynote speaker.